We're talking about evangelism today, evangelism. Um, if you didn't get one of the handouts, the notes for this morning in your bulletin, some of them didn't have it, have it go ahead and raise your hand now and uh, we'll, we'll have someone uh, bring one to you. <clears throat> Got one over here. Okay, so we're talking about evangelism today, but first I want to share with you a story. A ceramics teacher announced that his college class was going to be divided into two groups. All of the students on this side would be graded on the quantity of their work. The quality would not be taken into account whatsoever. All you have to do is just produce 50 pounds of pottery. I don't care how ugly it is. 50 pounds is an A, 40 pounds is a B, and so on. Okay? Now this side of the class, I don't care how much you do, just turn in one pot, and I'll grade that one pot. But it's got to be really good. Okay? So focus on quality or quantity. In this side, we're focusing on quantity, the number of pots over the quality. Okay? So that, that was his plan. In which group do you think produced the better quality pots? Raise your hand if you think this group produced the better quality. Just one person. Okay, raise your hand if you think this group produced the better quality pots. Everybody's wrong but Brandon. What did you know? That something very interesting happened. The, the, the group who was assigned to just start making pots, just start making pots, they didn't care if they made mistakes because the mistakes wouldn't be looked at. They got started, and they made some really ugly, like terrible pots, ashtrays or whatever you want to call them. They, they were just ugly. But they learned from their mistakes. They gained experience. And by the time they were done making 50 pounds worth of pots, they had practical, hands-on experience. They knew how the clay moved in their hands on the wheel. They knew what it took to, to dry it in a kiln without cracking it. They knew what it took because of all of the mistakes they made. They weren't afraid to make mistakes, so they made them. This group over here, however, they were very concerned with getting that one pot correct, and they didn't want to start until they knew everything they could possibly know about making pots. In the end, all they were left with was theory and inexperience and shoddy work. Well, what's the point then? What's the point then? Over and over again, when we see people who are experts in a field, when we see them uh, ask, like if you're watching a DVD and you're watching behind the scenes and they're interviewing the director, someone will invariably ask him, oh, wow, you're such a great director. How do you do what you do? How did you get as good as you got at directing? Or maybe one of the actors or actresses, how are you such a good actor? Or musicians, how are you so good at playing music? What can I do to get there as well? And almost every single time, the answer that they'll give is, just start. Just start. It doesn't matter how bad your first film is. Grab a camera, grab a phone, and just start. Don't be afraid of failing. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. Don't be afraid of doing a bad job. Just start. And it's the exact same way with evangelism, with doing personal Bible studies. You'll almost always get the same advice. The most important thing I want to leave us with here this morning is knowing this. Just start. Jump right in. I don't want to say the less you know, the better, but essentially, that's kind of what I'm saying. The less you know, the better. The people making the ugly pots were the ones who got all the experience. The ones who didn't, they didn't. However much you know or don't know right now is enough to get started. Don't get lost in the details. Expect to make mistakes. Learn from them, and your quality, your skills, will improve with each effort. Open up your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 5. This is where we'll start today. I, I love to start with excuses because that's, that's what I like to make. And maybe I'm not alone, but we'll start with excuses. Hebrews chapter 5. We're talking about conducting personal Bible studies this morning. Last week we talked about how to make contacts and get the Bible studies. So this week we're talking about naturally what to do when we're in those studies. But on that note, who has been praying this past week more to see evangelistic opportunities. Has anybody been praying more for that? 
Good, good. If you haven't been, consider starting. Who has, uh, who took the checklist last week and marked something, one or two of the ideas that we had, and they want to try them sometime this month? Has anybody done that? Okay, a few of us. Very good. If you haven't done it, again, in your notes this morning, you'll find the same checklist. It's not too late. It's not too late. You can always start. Has anybody actually gone out and done some evangelism this week? Something, something new? A few of us. Good, good. Let's make it all of us. Let's make it all of us. So we're making contacts. We're making Bible studies. But what's, what's my favorite excuse? What's my favorite excuse? Uh, it's this. I'll start when I know more. I'll, I'll start when I know more. And this is a lie. This is designed, uh, when I tell myself this, this is designed to soothe my conscience and, and to cripple my action. That's like saying, when I get in shape, then I'll start going to the gym. That's not how it works, right? You go to the gym and you put in the hard work in order to get into shape, right? But if we get it backwards, we get, it's, it's funny when we're talking about getting in shape physically, but when we're talking about getting in shape spiritually, oh, wait, now it makes sense. I'll start when I know more. No, that, that's a lie. We're not going to start when we know more. The truth is we're just not going to start if that's what we're telling ourselves. We learn to walk by trying to walk. Anybody who's had kids or has seen a kid walking or watch any TV show where kids starting to walk, do the parents ever laugh at the infant when they try to take their first step and they fall down? No. You know, they beam with pride just, just for trying. You know, they, they, they're encouraging them, yes, keep coming, don't worry about it. if you fall, get back up. It's okay, keep walking. We learn to walk by walking. We learn to do Bible studies by having Bible studies. I think you get the point. The truth is not, I'll start when I know more. The truth is, I'll start, then I'll know more. You catch the difference. The truth isn't, I'll start when I know more. It's, I'll start, then I'll know more. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. So number one, there is an expectation on our part by God to become a teacher. There is an expectation on our part by God to become teachers. We ought to become this. And the word ought there indicates a debt. Literally, it means a debt owed. This is something that must be paid. It's, it's the expectation. It's our duty to fulfill it. In other words, this isn't optional. This isn't optional. We ought to be teachers. This is our charge. We owe it to God. And we owe it to our fellow man. If we're going to call ourselves Christians, we ought to be teachers. We ought to be teachers. We're expected, again, to to move from the easy stuff, the milk, and start to be able to digest the meatier things of God's word. That was the the Hebrew's problem. They stayed drinking milk their whole lives, so to speak. They never graduated to solid food. But how do we graduate from milk to solid food? How do we become teachers? Luckily, the answer is given in the next two verses. Um, watch, Watch for it. The answer is by reason of use. Watch for it in the next couple verses. Verse 13, For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. A baby. These were big babies that the, the writer was writing to. Verse 14, But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, here it is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. How are you able to grow up from a baby into an adult? By reason of use. What was their problem? They weren't using what they knew. Their problem wasn't they didn't know enough. Their problem was they didn't use what they did know. The word they're exercising in the original Greek is gymnazo, and it's, it's just like what it sounds, gymnasium. Exercise, gymnasium. Okay. When you think of the gym, do you think of easy and comfortable and not really have to do any work, or someone else can do the work for you? No, it's hard and difficult, and nobody can take your place. You have to do the work for you. I can't work out for you. I can't get muscles for you, and you can't get muscles for me, right? That's not how exercise 
works. The word use is literally a habit. If you look up the word use, it literally means habit acquired by practice. So to bring it all together, if you use what you know, you'll grow. If you don't, you won't. You know it's true because it rhymes. I, I did that on accident. I didn't even do that on purpose. If you use what you know, you'll grow. If you don't, you won't. So if you've been a Christian for more than a few months, more than a few years, maybe a few decades, and you don't know how to conduct Bible studies, it's because you haven't been conducting Bible studies. That, that's it. That's it. You don't need to know everything before you get started. If this is your personality, I, I know there's a lot of people like that. They, they won't get started with something until they know everything about that thing. Fear of being embarrassed, fear of failure. You know, that can serve you well in some areas, but consider that, that personality attribute, consider that a vice in regards to evangelism, not a virtue. Consider that a passion. Consider that something to be overcome. Okay, so we're ready. We're ready. We just know, we know that we just need to go and get started. What do we do? So you've got your Bible study scheduled. In the meantime, a little bit of prep work wouldn't hurt. Study materials that will help in talking with a particular person that you have a study scheduled with. If you know he's an atheist or he's someone who used to believe in God but no longer does, some basic apologetics might be a good thing to study beforehand. Or if you know they have a background in, in one of the quote-unquote traditional denominations like uh, Catholicism or Baptist or Pentecostal, you know you can look into those things. You don't need to, to go crazy about spending hours and hours and hours. You can if you want to, but you don't need to. Just a little bit of cursory effort. What do they, what do they generally teach? What do they generally believe and why? can be helpful. Uh, if you're studying with someone who's maybe a Jehovah's Witness or Mormon, th that's completely different. So you, you're not going to learn, you're not going to find any of the other stuff helpful. You've got to study completely other different things. So just a little bit of prep work ahead of time can help. But again, don't let the feeling of being underprepared stop us from meeting at all. It's better to just go ahead knowing very, very little and get started and then find out in the first study what we need to brush up on. It's much better to do that than to say, well, I, I don't feel prepared enough, therefore I'm not going to do it. Okay, let's be very, very careful, careful about doing that. So a little bit of prep work can help. But what's next? We need to develop a procedure. Find something that works for you. Find something that works for you and use it. We've got a bunch of Bible study aids, um, and I want to share a few of them with you. Um, but if, if you don't like any of these, basically you can, you can also just take a notebook, write down some scriptures you want to discuss, and just read them and the, the, them dis, then discuss it. You know, it's as easy as that. You don't need to do anything formal or anything fancy. Just talk about the Bible with someone, and you'll learn. Just talk about the Bible with someone, and you'll learn. So um, all, of these, uh, all of these aids that we have here are basically just read a scripture, and then answer a question. So uh, one way that we can do that, we have these, these little bookmarks in the back, basic Bible references. It has um, uh, scriptures on authority of the Bible, baptism, being saved, church, all sorts of things. Really helpful. You don't have to memorize all of these things. It'd be helpful if you did, but you don't have to. You can just carry one of these around. Um, or you can do what some, some of the young people did. Um, we, we had some of these scriptures printed out on a little piece of paper, and we just taped it to the inside of our Bible. Anywhere I have my Bible, I have a Bible study with me. I don't have to memorize it. It's helpful if I do again, but you don't have to. You don't have to. Okay, there's that. We also have the, um, the, the Fishers of Men tracks, Searching for Truth. There's, I think, like 15 or 20 of these now, but you don't need to study all of them. I think just the first six or seven are enough. These are very, very good. It's been, uh, people have been using these since 1977, and over 20,000 souls have been added to the Lord's Church by following this, this very simple thing. You read a scripture, you answer a question very simple. That's like one to two people every single day for the past few decades obeying the gospel just because someone took the time to study this. We also have um, the Bobby Bates um, Back to the Bible. Um, the, these uh, are uh, much shorter. There's only three of these, and I think you only need to do like one or two in order to get to the point. Um, one drawback of this is it's, it's thorough. It's very, very thorough, and it might take uh, you know, six or seven or eight weeks before you start to get to some of the more important matters. But it lays the foundation. It's very, very good. If you have the time to, if you have the time to do that, it's not a bad idea to go ahead and do that. But if you don't have as much time, maybe try one of these. Read through it and see how you like it. 
We also have, of course, the one that, uh, that Brother Gary developed with us. It's very, very good as well, the Explore series. Read the question, read the scripture, answer the question. It's very easy. Uh, we also have, oh, th this is one that I really like. Um, say, say that you don't have uh, enough time. Say maybe you, you only have one opportunity, you only have five minutes to talk to somebody, and you're afraid you're never going to see them again. This is called Three Scriptures and a Gingerbread Man. You know why? Three scriptures and a gingerbread man. Okay. So all you have to do, you take a napkin, you take a, a, a receipt, a piece of paper, whatever you have, and draw a gingerbread man or a stick man or whatever you can do, and then you just write next to it these three scriptures. First one, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. He is the head. The body is the church. Okay. So you ask them, how many heads? One. Who's the head? Jesus. Okay. Uh, how many bodies? One. What is the body? The church. Okay, what if, what if there was one head in a bunch of different churches? Is that what the verse says? No. Okay, very easy. And then you go to uh, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5. And we read, what, what washes away our sins? What washes away our sins? The blood of Jesus. Very easy. You just read the, scrip the scripture and it tells you what washes away our sins. The blood of Jesus. Well, where is your blood? Is it inside your body or outside your body? Inside my body. You know, it doesn't take a lot of you know, mental effort, uh, the, these aren't trick questions. Okay, where is Jesus' blood? Is it inside his body or outside of his body? Inside of his body. So if we want to access his blood that removes our sins, do we need to be inside his body? Yes. Okay, very easy. And then the last scripture, the question that comes up, well, how do we get into his body where we can have our sins forgiven? There we go. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. We are baptized into Christ. So do you need to be baptized in order to be saved? Yes. Okay, there, it's very easy. You know, five minutes. It takes five minutes to learn, and you can do it with, with just a napkin and a broken pencil. Super easy. Super easy. Find something that works for you. We also have DVDs. Um, if you're just so uncomfortable talking to someone or leading a Bible study or whatever, we've got DVDs. Just pop it in the DVD player and just watch it with them. Hey, I, I gotta, I'm not very good at teaching people. Um, let's watch this and then talk about it. Just watch that. The Searching for Truth ones are very good. Or we also have the one uh, by uh, Brother Don Blackwell, What Must I Do to Be Saved? Uh, if if your, your prospect, your student, your friends, if they're interested in other things, there's, you know, a hundred different topics that you can find DVDs or videos for. They're also online, um, and these things are just, you know, ripping expensive. They're like a dollar a piece, you know, ugh, if you can't afford that, I'll give you one of these. You can have it for free, or you can just go on online to YouTube and just watch it for free anyway. Okay, DVDs are a very good one to use as well. Another one that, that you, you may be familiar with is uh, for the Michael Shanks book, Muscle in a Shovel. If you haven't read this book, I would, I would very, very much encourage you to read it. It, it looks thick and intimidating, but um, it, the chapters are like a page uh, long each. It, it's very quick read. It's very quick read. And the, the words are large, too, so it's not as big as it looks. It, th this is basically this guy, he was a studied with him, and then he became a member of the Lord's Church. And he just wrote down his story. That's it. And you can tell your prospect, hey, I'm, I'm going to let you borrow this book. Go ahead and read the first four chapters, and then tomorrow we'll get together over a cup of coffee, and uh, we'll talk about it. Easy. Easy. Um, this book in particular, uh, last I looked, people have been handing these things out like they're, like they're candy on Halloween. Okay? There's been 49,000 souls obeying the gospel just because of people using this book. Is it effective? You bet. You bet. But you got to hand it out. You got to share it with people. Okay. But uh, one thing that I want to keep in mind, if you do hand out a book or a DVD, you better read it first. You better watch it first. Know what you're handing to people. Know what you're, what you're giving out. So you're in the study and uh, dun, dun, dun. They ask you a question. No, oh, no. What are you going to do? They ask me a question. Um, what do I do? First of all, great. Think of this as a great thing. If someone is asking you questions, that probably means that they're, that they're somewhat engaged. They're interested. Okay, this is a good thing. Even if they're asking you a lot of questions, even if they're being combative, you know, see it as a good thing. Now, there's ways you can handle that if they're being combative, but it helps me to know that it's okay to say, I don't know. It is okay to say that. Have you guys ever seen a politician on TV ask some random question that like nobody knows, and everybody knows that nobody knows the answer to this question, and then instead of saying, oh, you know, I don't know, I'll, I'll look into that for you. 
what do they say? Oh, this and that, and blah, blah, blah. And they're rambling on, and they, everybody knows they're making it up, and everybody knows they're not making any sense. D does your respect for that person go up or go down? Yeah. It certainly doesn't go up. You know, oh, here they go again, change the channel. But if you're humble enough and honest enough with yourself and with your friends to say, you know, I don't know everything. Why don't we find out together? You want to get, to, you know, get together at my place or yours? It, it sounds like we both need to study the Bible a little more. It's okay to say I don't know, but a great follow-up to I don't know is I'll find out before our next study. I'll find out before our next study. It's a great follow-up. It shows that you're interested in their question, and it can also help you get another study. Think about... Think about how you feel about those politicians. We don't, we don't want to be that guy. We don't want to be that guy. That said, if a question is wildly off topic, okay, you're talking about salvation, or you're talking about the church, and they come out of left field and say, hey, what, what does the star in Revelation chapter 9, verse 1 represent? And you're like, what? <laughs> does anybody know that? I don't know. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll try to find out. The answer might still be, I don't know, but you know, maybe we can put that off until, until a later time. Now, if, if someone is asking you a question, and you know it's, it's, it's just going to, you're going to be running down a rabbit hole somewhere, and you're not going to come back up for air for another couple weeks, you know, just say, maybe we can come back to that. Maybe we can come back to that. That's, that is okay. Um, on the other hand, if a question is loaded, do you think my dear sweet grandma is in heaven? You know, they, they may be sincere in asking that, but that question is loaded with emotion. And it's important to handle those kinds of things appropriately. Um, it's important to say, you know, it doesn't matter what I think, okay? It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't even matter what dear sweet grandma thinks. What I want to find out is what the Bible says. Let's find out what the Bible says we need to do to get to heaven. It's as simple as that. If a question generates more heat than light, it might be best to avoid that question. Jesus did it especially when the question was coming out of um, unrighteous motives. He just wouldn't answer the question. He says, I'm not going to answer that. Or he'll say, I'll answer that if you answer my question. So it's okay to think like that. It's okay to think like that. Jesus regularly did. So that said, does our approach matter? Does our approach matter? Why don't our efforts work out sometimes? We need to remember, first of all, that, that even Jesus and his apostles didn't have a 100% success rate, not even close to that. And that's okay. But that said... Can we change our approach from time to time and get better or worse results? I want to give you an illustration. Here we have uh, my favorite comic strip, Calvin and Hobbes, and we, we have Calvin here. He's selling a swift kick in the butt for one dollar, okay? And then his friend Hobbes, he says, how's business? <coughs> Terrible. And of course, Hobbes, oh, that's hard to believe. I can't, I can't understand it. Everybody I know needs what I'm selling. <laughs> and that might be true. That, that might be 100% true, and what we say might be 100% true, but it's just not getting across. Could it be our methods? Could it be our methods? You know, there, there's some people who, who Calvin's approach would be very appealing to. Just be, be very frank, be very blunt. Don't, don't, don't mince your words. Just say, if I'm wrong, just tell me I'm wrong and show me why. You know, a lot of people are like that. Feel free to do it that way, if that's the case. But I would wager, I would guess, that most people are not. Most people are not. We need to try different methods. We need to try different methods. Paul would certainly say that our approach matters. In, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, this is basically a treatise on Paul doing just that. We don't have time to go into detail on what he did there, but essentially Paul would change his approach depending on his audience. The truth is still the truth. The truth never changes, but you can present it differently. You can present it differently. Acts chapters 13, 17, and 23, if you want to read them later tonight. Again, we don't have time to get into them right now. Those are very good examples of Paul putting into practice what he was teaching in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Acts chapters 13, 17, and 23, and elsewhere. You know, just, just read through all of Acts, and you'll see all the cool things that Paul did. But just a short version of it. Notice when Paul is speaking to the Gentiles. Mark down how many times he mentions Abraham or David, or the prophets, or the old law. Mark it down. It'll be a very short list. Basically zero. But on the other hand, when he's talking to Jews, he basically won't stop talking about the prophets, and Abraham, and Moses, and the old law, and this, and he won't stop talking about it, because that's what appeals to them. 
for uh, in Acts chapter 17, the idolatrous people in Athens, they weren't Jews, they had other problems. Um, he started where they were. He started where they were. He said, basically, look, you're already worshiping the right God. Let me just tell you more about him. They had an altar to the unknown God. So he said, okay, let me tell you a little bit more about him. He, uh, he apparently, in verse 28, this is really interesting to me, he even read up on some of their literature. He quotes one of their own poets to prove his point. He used what they knew about. He used what they were interested in to get the word across. And the word was the exact same word that he preached to the Jews, but he just approached it a different way. Again, the more you study with people, the better you'll get at this, um, and that's okay. That's okay. So what are some guidelines for our approach? Very quickly, I want to look at some guidelines that Scripture gives uh, on how some various ways we can approach our Bible studies, some ways we can think about it. Proverbs chapter 15, we're going to go very quickly. Proverbs 15, 28, the heart of the righteous studies how to answer. I can't talk to some people like I can talk to my two older brothers. <laughs> You're stupid, cut that out. You know, I, can't, I can talk to my brothers like that, and they can talk to me like that, but I can't talk to pretty much anybody else that way. I need to know that. It's not enough to know the truth. Knowing the truth is necessary, but the Bible says if we are righteous, we also need to study how to answer people. We need to study how to answer people. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Jesus says, <clears throat> Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 16, uh, 15 and 16. Paul says, I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls. I did not burden you. We need to have a cheerfulness, a, a readiness, a willingness to happily go out and share the word. It shouldn't be a reluctance on our part. He was very glad not only to share the word, but to spend of himself and his resources, to, to, to devote his life for that. Our attitude ought to be the same. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 uh, verses 19 through 22, this is what we referenced earlier, but essentially the short version is, Paul says, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win them more. Verse 22, I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And then the verses between there talks about some different things that he did. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. Paul says, but we were gentle, we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. How gentle is a nursing mother with her infant? That's how gentle Paul was among the Thessalonians. Verse 8, so affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. He was there to serve, not to be served, because you had become dear to us. Finally, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and verse 14, there's many other verses we can look at, but for the sake of time, he, he says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. And that last one there, patient, is, is something that very much characterized uh, the need when someone was studying with me, Brother Jeff in particular. I was asking him all sorts of dumb questions, and he very patiently and very kindly took a lot of time, <laughs> a lot of time, and studied with me and answered all my dumb questions, and he showed me and led me to the right way. And whenever I talk to people who, who, have, uh, who are the first generation Christian in their family, a lot of times what they say is what they appreciate in, in people studying the Bible with them is their patience, their patience. So let's remember that. These are just a sampling of things that, we, that ought to characterize us as we share God's word. Wise, patient, gentle, harmless, as we convince and exhort people. So, okay, Evan, I know roughly what to do. You're saying, okay, I know what to do, um, and I know how to do it, great, but I need some motivation. Can you give me some reasons that I, that I ought to go out and actually do it? You know, other than God says to do it? Yes, sure. Uh, reason number one. It's a great way to examine our faith. It's a great way to examine our faith. We have absolutely nothing to fear by having our faith examined. Unlike many denominations, 
they, who forbid their members from, from talking to anybody or studying with anybody who would disagree or reading anything written by anybody who would disagree. Um, we don't do that. Quite the opposite. Read whatever you want from any atheist. That's fine. Read anything written by any Jehovah's Witness. Brother Johnny Robertson has a TV program up in Virginia where he preaches on, on television, and regularly the pastors up there will say, don't you dare watch his TV program. But the members watch it anyway. That's another story. Uh, some of the members here were studying, or were they, they were trying to get a study with a, a Jehovah's Witness in training, and basically what they said was, you know, I'm not allowed to study with anybody until I'm fully indoctrinated. You know, that's, that's not good. That's not good. We, we ought not to be that way. If you have the truth, you shouldn't, shouldn't you be able to easily disprove any contradictory claims? Wouldn't that only bolster your faith? Wouldn't that only make you stronger? We invite it. We invite arguments and reasons and logic from people who oppose us. We're not afraid of being examined. It's not because we're so arrogant. You know, we, we just think we're always right. Oh, you think you have a quarter on truth. You think you're so perfect. You're always right. No, far from it. It's the exact, the exact opposite, actually. We know we're fallible. We know we've been wrong before. So if you can help us and show us the right way, we, we appreciate it. You'll be our best friend. You know, it's, it's only going to make us better. If we're wrong about something now and you teach us the right way, great. We've got nothing to be afraid of. Why should we study with other people? Because it's a great way to examine and improve our faith. Number two, you'll learn. You'll learn a lot. I usually, uh, when I, whenever I teach somebody else or whenever I preach or whenever I do anything like that, I know that I learn far more than anybody I'm teaching. When, when I'm in the driver's seat, so to speak, I learn so much. Not only that, but, but maybe uh, I'm, I'm just in a study and I'm the silent partner, okay? Um, it's hard having your beliefs contradicted. It's hard having your beliefs challenged. And that motivates you to find out if I'm right or not, if they're right or not. It motivates you to start studying more. The times I was most challenged were the times that I grew the most. Number three, and I think this is a very important one, think about what if nobody share the gospel with you? What if whoever studied with you, maybe it was your parents who raised you uh, with the church, or maybe it was someone who came and, and, and taught you the gospel, what if they just said, you know, I'm too busy to do that, or I'm not ready to do that, or I don't want to do that? Where would you be? I don't want to let down people out there who are waiting on me to teach them the gospel. I don't want to let them down. I want to make myself available for them, and I hope that we all have the same attitude. What if the person who taught you didn't take the time to teach you? I hate to think where I would be. So final tips this morning. Before we wrap up, I gathered some tips from a number of experienced evangelists, and in no particular order, these are just some of their favorite things to keep in mind. Number one, don't go it alone. Don't go it alone. Alone, Jesus regularly would send out his followers in pairs, and we also find Paul and the other Christians in the Bible bringing others along with them to help when they would go out evangelizing. I think this is for good reason. Having someone there with you can be a, a means of moral support, even if they just sit there and don't say anything. Just having someone there uh, who's a friend on your side can help. And on the other hand, if, if you're the one who wants to be the silent partner, maybe you're, you're a little bit newer at it, that's okay too, because you just being there is helping the other person, and it also, it teaches you learn by seeing. That's what I did when I first started coming here. I would follow Igor around, or I would follow uh, Guy around, or Jeff around, and, and I would just, I would be there with the study. I wouldn't say anything, but I would be soaking it all up. I didn't know enough to conduct the studies all by myself quite yet, at least I didn't think I did, but I did know enough to say, hey, Brother Jeff, can you come study with, uh, with my brother? Sure. Sure. And I was there too. And my brother appreciated me being there because I knew him, and it was not as weird, and that, that's another good thing. Number two, get to know the person. Get to know the person. Tell me a little bit about yourself. It's a great way to start any study. You're just talking to people. Tell me a little bit about yourself, and then you tell a little bit about yourself to them. Number three, keep calm. What if things get contentious? Uh, how do you handle things if it gets hot? You know, a little bit of argument starts bubbling up. Keep calm. It, it's best, the, the best advice I heard regarding this is stop it before it gets started. The, there's, um, you know, it, it's best to keep things calm and civil. One preacher said, you know, we're not going to argue. We're not going to get upset. We're just looking at God's Word. We're just studying the Bible. It's hard to learn a lot if you're upset, if you're getting hot on the collar. Okay? If you sense things are going in that direction, just like Barney Fife said, nip it in the bud. You know, stop it before it gets started, right? Nip it. Nip it in the bud.
take your time. Take your time. It's okay if you're studying with someone who's stubborn or if they're just slow. Take your time. They, they, oftentimes, they're just trying to be very sure of what you're teaching them before they make a change. This is not a bad thing. One brother I talked to, he's a missionary in Japan. He met a lady, and she bluntly said, I have no interest in becoming a Christian. I just, I, I don't want to be a Christian. You know, she said it in Japanese. Um, but that, that was essentially what she was saying. Five years of interacting with her and studying with her and talking with her. Five years. What if he gave up on her? What if he took her at her word? I don't want to be a Christian. Okay. And the interesting thing he said, in Japan, five years is actually really quick. It's not uncommon for it to take 10 years or 20 years or more. That's typical. It's okay if people take a little bit of time. Let's let's not give up on people after five days or five weeks. Keep at it. Number six, No. Number five, here we are. Number five, keep at it. With people who have shown little interest in the past, especially family members who we care a lot about. Um, th- this could be the case. Continue asking them, not incessantly, but, but think about it, especially after major life events. Maybe uh, your children are grown up, and then they, they have their own kids. Or maybe the death of a loved one, the loss of a job, or maybe they have a health scare. Try a different approach. Maybe don't start with the most contentious thing. Start with something you agree about and start talking about that. And then you can eventually build a foundation to, um, to some of the other things. You don't need to start with Acts chapter 2, verse 38. You don't need to start with instrumental music. You don't need to start with the most contentious thing. Start with something you agree on. Hey, God exists, right? Let me tell you this cool thing I learned. Also, especially with family, it might be a good idea to have someone else study with them because sometimes it's just a personality thing. We, we know our family. They know us. And it just doesn't work. It's okay to ask someone else for help. Number six, don't embarrass them. Be careful not to embarrass people. It's okay if they don't know the difference between the book of John and the book of 1 John. You know, this happened to me. (laughs) My friend laughed at me. It wasn't very funny to me. True story. Um, Don't don't embarrass people. Whenever possible, if, if they say something and it's just obviously wrong and you know it's wrong and you prove it wrong, don't rub it in. If they say, oh, yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Good. Because that's what the Bible says. You know, don't rub it in. Just, just be very gracious. Be very gentle in understanding. Number seven, be flexible. Roll with their excuses because the excuses will come. Even if they have a good and honest heart, you can expect excuses. Okay? When my parents were first introduced to the church, they had three very young boys, myself and my two older brothers. I think we were like anywhere from like five to one. And it was a mess. So naturally... They, they were reluctant. Oh, I don't know if we want to have people coming in the house. It's messy, and they're, like, running around, and it's hectic, and the boys are crazy and yelling and stuff. So what, what they did was the, the, the couple who was studying with them, they said, okay, that's fine. We'll come late at night after, the, after you put the boys to bed. They were flexible. It was a legitimate excuse. They weren't just trying to get out of it. Maybe part of them was, but part of them, it was legitimate. You know, how are you going to study the Bible if there's, like, toddlers running around and screaming? and <laughs> You can't. Or sometimes they, they might come during the day, and the wife would babysit us or take us to the park or play with us or whatever. And then the husband would study with my parents. It's a great way, great way to handle excuses, being flexible. It took weeks for them to, to be able to just set up the study in the first place, but they persisted without becoming a pest. They were not too pushy. One brother invited someone to church, and he said, yeah, I'm definitely going to make it. Oh, I'm totally going to be there. I'm going to be there. And then come Sunday... He wasn't there. You know, of course he wasn't there. And then he called his friend up, and he said, oh, why weren't you there? He said, oh, I couldn't find it. He wasn't sure if he believed him or not, but he rolled with it. He rolled with the excuse. So the next, n- the next day, he took him home from work, and on the way home, he drove past, he drove past the church building, and his friend was able to see where it was. So he, he, instead of saying, oh, that's an excuse, just call and come, you know, he said, okay, let, let's just fix that. Let's just fix that. And the next Sunday he came, with his whole family, and the next Sunday he came again, and they've been going ever since. And I believe he and his whole family are members of the church. One excuse that might have derailed us, oh, they don't really care, they said they'd come, they didn't come. But just roll with it. Roll with the excuses. Be flexible. Number eight, this one's interesting. Don't or do call ahead of time. Let, let me explain that. Um, one brother who goes door knocking not, uh, a lot, he said, if, if he sets up a Bible study, so uh, we're going today, and then um, day after tomorrow, 
we're going to uh, come back and we'll set up. A, we'll, we'll come back for Bible study. Okay, great. What he used to do is he would call ahead of time, the day before. Oh, just wanted to check and see if uh, if, if we're still on for tomorrow. And more often than not, what he said would happen is, oh, you know, actually something came up and you know like this and excuses and backing out and you know et cetera et cetera. So instead of that, he already knew where they lived. He would just he would just show up at the time they agreed. He he wouldn't bother to to call ahead of time because they already set a date and they agreed on it. Um, and they can't back out of it if, if you're there at the doorstep. At least it's harder to. On the other hand, if you're studying with someone um, outside of their home, maybe you're meeting at a restaurant or a park or, or a library or something, it, it might be a very good idea to go ahead and call them ahead of time and remind them. Just want to make sure we're still on for tomorrow. Do you need a ride? Can I come pick you up? Make it, make it easy for them to say yes. Make it hard for them to back out of it. Um, again, not, not being pushy, but just genuinely being helpful is what we want to do. Number nine, set a time limit and stick with it. At least set a time limit for yourself. If you say it's only going to be an hour, make sure you stick with it. Keep your word. You might only be able to cover one or two questions in that time, but that's okay. Again, don't rush it. Now, if they want to keep going, feel free, but keep in mind you don't want to overstay your welcome or overwhelm them with too much all at once. A lot of what you'll be saying, a lot of what they'll be hearing, they'll be hearing it for the first time. It's completely brand new. It's completely contradictory to everything they've learned the whole lives. It's, it's not going to absorb all at once. Give them a little bit of time to sleep on it, think about it, to chew, it on, to, to chew on it. Set a time limit, stick with it. Uh, number 10, it's okay to repeat yourself. It's okay to repeat yourself. It's okay to repeat yourself. Especially if someone is older, they're entrenched in whatever denomination, they, they've, they've been in a long time. It's, it's hard for a Jehovah's Witness to wrap his mind around no, Jesus wasn't created. Jesus isn't the Michael, the archangel. Jesus is God. It, it's hard. It's just as hard for them to believe the truth on the Bible as it is for you to believe what they say. Maybe even harder. If they've been taught their whole lives that Joseph Smith is the prophet from God, it's okay if, if you don't convince them on the first study. It's okay if you need to repeat yourself. No, baptism is actually before salvation. Oh, okay. And then the next week, wait, no, no, you're saved and then you're baptized. No, actually, no, we, we, we talked about it last week. You, know, you, you, you get baptized and then you're saved, is what Jesus said. Right? Oh, okay. And the next week, wait, aren't you uh, baptized after you're saved? No, no, no. And every time it get a little bit easier, but it's going to take a little bit of time sometimes to, to correct the error that they've been taught over and over again. And finally, keep the focus on the Bible. Keep the focus on the Bible. So you mean to tell me that you need to be baptized before you're saved? Hang on. <laughs> Is it me telling you that, or did we just read that? Is it Jesus telling you that? It, do it doesn't matter what I'm telling you. Don't believe me if I'm telling you something. If Jesus is telling you something, you better believe it. What, what, does, your church, uh, what does your church think about... Hang on. <laughs> It doesn't matter what my church thinks. It doesn't matter what I think. I, I just want to do what the Bible says. Keep the focus on the Bible. Let's find out what the Bible says about whatever. Okay. Keep the focus on the Bible. We asked this question last week, and to wrap it up, we'll ask the same question. What if, what if all of this is just too much for us? Uh, I want to get started. I don't know where to start. This is the one thing I want you to remember this morning. If, if all of this is just simply too much, um, this is what you can do. Before you leave this building this morning, ask someone, one of the members here, who regularly has Bible studies, just say, hey, can I join you? Can I be a silent partner with you on your next Bible study? Just do that. <coughs> if, if your head is swimming and this is just too much, just go ahead and do that. Go ahead and do that. If you're serious about serving God, if, if soul, saving souls is, is something important to you, do that. The question we asked ourselves last week is where we'll end this morning. If you could be shown that you can't get to heaven doing what you're doing right now, would you change? You know, we ought to be people who sincerely ask ourselves that question. We need to be looking for people who ask themselves that question as well. Whether you're a Christian or not, God wants us to test all things. He wants us to hold fast that which is good, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and verse 21. He wants us to seek after him and to serve him, Acts chapter 17 and verse 27. I don't want to stand before God with excuses in my pocket. I don't want to stand before God with excuses after this life is over, not having done what I know is expected of me. Is it hard? Yes. Yes. But it's the things in life that are hard or, or the things that are worth doing. Is it hard? Yes. But let's not 
let that stop us. Can we help you obey the gospel this morning? Do you know what you need to do? Can we uh, pray for you this morning? Please, would you let us know right now. Come forward as we together stand and sing for your encouragement.